Uh, before we get going, I know that y'all have met Andrew, and I know you you kind of met our other uh, distinguished guests this evening. But if you guys wouldn't mind taking about one to one minute to nine seconds, and kind of not just you know telling us who you are, but also give us a little bit of your background, so that way they kind of know that that you guys are coming from different perspectives in terms of your own tradition and your own history. So, Jack, I'll start with you. I've been everything but a Roman Catholic priest. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. And the reason I haven't been that is because I've been married and I have five children. <laughs> and they wouldn't let me do that. And there's still time. And so, they're so strict. Uh, no, but uh, my general background is Baptist. Uh, I became a Christian in a little Baptist church at the age of 12. And then I was a Baptist for a long time. I was a Baptist. Went to a Baptist school. Went one one semester to a Southern Seminary in, in Louisville, uh, pastored Baptist churches uh, until 1962. Yeah, something like in there. And uh, so my whole background, my wife's dad was a Baptist deacon, and so uh, I was in Southern Baptist churches, Baptist, Baptist uh, through and through. And that was my whole parameters. 1962, an experience uh, with the Lord uh, where I spoke in tongues mm -hmm. and began to worship the Lord in that uh, dimension. And that kind of moved me out of the Baptist circles for a and season. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, <laughs> then I was a part of the theater of Pentecostal, the Assemblies of God or charismatic work, an independent charismatic work. I've tried to read widely all my life. Uh, I've read Reformed Theology <coughs> deeply, learned much from it, um, all, all kinds of things. And I change all the time. Oh, my, uh, all my tombstones will be written, but on the other hand. <laughs> and so uh, I've been in ministry for a long time. I used to preach at 16, I went to my, my first sermon was when I was 16 years old. Uh, Kathy and I married very early. I was 20 and she was 17. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, my thought it would last to be very 65 years. Wow. Wow. So, well done. So anyway, that's, that's good. And I'm just a learner. If there's anything I am, it's, it's, I, I want to learn and, and be faithful. I'm not a pastor now at this point. Uh, Dave came in and pushed me right out. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I can't uh, but, <laughs> <I, laughs> but, but they let me have an office, uh, and I go in every day just about, and uh, I teach Sunday school, Wednesday night, and that sort of thing. So I, the Lord's helped me to keep uh, busy, and this is a great time. I get to go in and pray and study and read. And uh, any bad things come along, I just say, there's the pastor across the hall. <laughs> Andrew. Um, so I was uh, born into a devout Christian family. Uh, Baptist. Raised, raised a Baptist. Are you detecting a pattern here? <laughs> um, Mom and Dad uh, love Christ and faithful. Far from perfect, but uh, followers of the Lord. Uh, late teens, I began to investigate... Um, or reformational theology, and uh, was at that point heavily influenced by people like everybody from A.W. Tozer to uh, Francis Schaeffer and uh, Harold O.J. Brown, later on Cornelius Van Til, and various others. Uh, so I became uh, reformational. I could say reformed, but that almost implies a little stricter than what I am. I have a strong Feel strong continuity with the Reformation. Over the years, have developed um, theologically a kinship with uh, Christian worldview thinking. You may have heard of Abraham Kuyper and that whole sort of Dutch Reformed tradition, which is really committed to applying the faith and culture. So um, I uh, am sort of sort of a systematic theologian, but more uh, a cultural theologian, uh, committed to applying the faith. Uh, in culture. Uh, Orthodox and conservative, believe in the Bible, the Word of God, historic orthodoxy, and so on. So, uh, my wife is here. We've been married. Uh, was married. I was married. I was 19. She was 20 when we were married. Oh, woman. 
<laughs> she was robbing the cradle of me. We have five adult children, they're all in the 30s. We have three grandchildren. Um, and I lead the Center for Cultural Leadership, which is a ministry designed to influence Christians to be more culturally influential, um, suggesting that the faith is much wider than the church and the family, although it certainly should be there too, but should apply in, uh, in wider society. Uh, most people would consider me sort of like a, a Christian egghead, more like an intellectual, uh, not an ivory tower intellectual, but uh, part of what some people would call the adversarial intelligentsia. Most of the intellectuals today are really at war with God. They're a group of us that aren't at war with God. We want to speak thoughtfully in a, in a distinctively Christian way. So that's mine. Great. Well, I... Uh... I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of these guys. I, I grew up in a, in, a, uh, in a devout family. I, well, my, my father was sometimes devout, we'll put it that way, but always a great father. But, uh, but uh, uh, third generation, actually, Pentecostal. Um, and uh, in fact, I uh, ended up inheriting a, a Bible from my great uncle, who was a Pentecostal preacher. And they say that he got burned out of brush arbors. And I don't even know what a brush arbor is, hardly. But, um, actually, I've read some of his sermons. I understand why they burn out, but um, I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, so I, I had a, kind of a, a long um, history uh, and experience in the, uh, in the Pentecostal uh, area. Uh, and um, uh, love, I can't ever remember a time that I didn't love God's Word. I remember my mother teaching me, really, I learned how to read. This sounds strange. I learned how to read out the King James Bible, which is, you know, be almost, you'd think it would be almost impossible today, but my mom just sat me down, and before I ever got to kindergarten, I was able to read, and it was through a, you know, through a King James Bible, she just sat there and read with me and taught me stories. So I, I've always had a love for God's Word, never wanted to, never wanted to be a, a minister, I wanted to, wanted to play for the shortstop with the <coughs> Tigers. Uh, unfortunately, the Tigers had no foresight in signing me. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up uh, actually uh, uh, going to college. I played ball in college, but I ended up uh, in marketing and advertising. And when I, uh, when I left, I took a job as the director of marketing at a, uh, at a building company. And grew with it for 20 years, 25 years. I was the director of marketing for a, uh, uh, for a national um, building manufacturer. And, uh, but during that time, I felt like, all during that time, I had been involved deeply in other, in other ministries um, and, uh, find, and really believed that God was calling me to start a church. The reason he was calling me to start a church is because no church was existing without me. <laughs> so we started a church and, and God blessed it and, and it was some, some reckless things took place and we pastored there for about 20 years and uh, ended up, um, ended up in, in a bad sense, being involved in some national headlines. We ended up taking a lawsuit all the way to the Supreme Court. And the, back then, it was the Relupa Law, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Um, and uh, we didn't, we didn't hardly win on the land use, but I almost became an institutionalized person. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. About that. <laughs> but anyway, um, but uh, so we, we I pastored for 20 years um, and. Um, uh, and really loved it. Uh, that, actually, I met Andrew during that time. Um, he was gracious enough to allow me to do some writing for, um, at that time, uh, the Chalcedon um, Report. And, um, and he became a regular at the church. And um, So that's really my, that's, today, I'm, today I'm actually living in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, I have eight, eight kids total, four boys and four girls, and five of them are down in Cleveland, Tennessee. I've got, I've got uh, three of them at Lee University right now, uh, one of them at the uh, University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. Uh, I've got a couple of daughters and grandchildren up in Michigan, so that's, that's my story. Yes. Don? Well, I'm Don Littlefield, and uh, Elaine and I come from the thriving metropolis of Center, Tufton Borough, New Hampshire. We have in the middle of our town a general store and a post office all in the same building, and that's it. So we're out in the country. Um, Andrew was talking today about uh, how many of us grew up in Christian homes and there was a, a perpetuity of blessing through generations. That was not my experience. Uh, God had to short circuit the generational uh, destruction in my family. 
and uh, I received the Lord Jesus a month shy of my 28th birthday. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time in what's called the Lakes region of New Hampshire, central New Hampshire, uh, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association was very active. And um, they sponsored in May of 1970, several months after <coughs> David Wilkerson, the writer of author of Cross and Switchblade, and Teen Challenge Ministry in New York and other places. And um, David came for one night in May of 1970, and when he left after that one night, I was uh, less than a year old in, in the Lord, uh, a, a revival, a genuine moving and presence of the ministering presence of the Holy Spirit stayed in Laconia, New Hampshire for several years. And in May, uh, soon after that evening, uh, visiting my terminally ill mom in the hospital at the time, uh, I did one of these with the Bible, which I don't recommend you do. It's kind of like asking the Lord to bless my mom, who was on her deathbed at the time, with something from the scripture. And he spoke to me directly from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, and called me to the ministry. Now I'm um, 28 years old, and so I began to seek how the Lord would have me and my young family go somewhere to seminary or whatever to prepare for whatever he wanted me to be setting my hand and heart to. And try as I would, I could not get a door to open uh, for to go away to study for the ministry. And uh, along about that time, long story a little shorter, I met Brother Jack Carter, who came and visited us all the way from Corpus Christi to uh, New Hampshire, Laconia, New Hampshire. And uh, the Lord built a, an enormous bridge between us, and uh, I went on to become uh, one of his protégés. Jack Carter is my mentor in the faith. And we've blinked, and some 49 years have gone by. Uh, but uh, it's been a wonderful uh, uh, time, and not without loss, not without mistakes, mm -hmm. not without uh, getting things wrong and having to go back and make them as right as we can. Mm -hmm. But we've seen the beginning of uh, two or three churches, and uh, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And, and here we are now, and. Uh, Delighted, among other things, that uh, Brother Jack has been uh, an enormous um, contrib made an enormous contribution to, to my life personally and the life of my family. And so I'm delighted to be here today. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, <clears throat> before I before I enter into the questions, let me just kind of tell you how these guys intersect with me. Uh, obviously, everybody knows that Jack is my father-in-law, and of course, I've known him for about 20 years. And I want to say almost as much as, as, as long as I've known uh, Don. It's kind of close to that. Craig's the only guy that I, I haven't really known that well, but our our paths have intersected in very odd ways, and there's a couple of stories there that are that actually are very interesting. I can go into those later, but I'm glad he's here. Because when I knew that Craig was going to be here, I, I asked him. I said, "I'll let you come and videotape only if." You participated in this round table with us. And I he, make everyone look good. Yeah. <laughs> and he was gracious enough to say yes. But, uh, but Craig aside, you know, if I were to, if I don't mean in terms of uh, people I've read or, uh, you know, uh, theologians I've studied or whatever, but if you were to ask me to rank uh, the top 10 men who have, who have made a deposit of me and who have shaped me in terms of my own. Uh, abilities in, in vocation and ministry and all, you're looking at three of them right here, Jack, Andrew, and Don, to be sure. And that's not to say that, that we agree on everything. We don't. Much to my own uh, dismay, uh, they I don't agree with them, and that's to my own detriment. And much to their own wisdom, they don't agree with me. So that's probably good. Uh, but I appreciate your being here tonight and, and doing this, because you, and I say all that to say you have a wealth of information, and we're not going to be able to scratch the surface. Uh, for you gentlemen, and, and you'll affirm this, I know, you guys have not seen any of these questions that have been submitted. And, and I did that I don't on, think it's fair. <laughs> and, I, and I did that on purpose just to put them on the hot seat. Um, but I am going to ask because there's no way we're going to get through all these questions. And any one of these questions we could spend a whole week on, to be sure. So that being said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and keep this time as well. I'm going to ask you a question that's been submitted. And then as you want to respond, you're welcome to. We don't have to go in any particular order. You don't have to respond if you don't want to respond. So we only hear from a couple of you. But I'm going to ask, and this is going to be terrible, but I'm going to ask that you try to limit your response to two minutes. 
And it's going to keep us on a tangent, and it's also going to allow us to kind of work through more questions. <coughs> and just and raise your hand. There you go. And it's not to then say that we can't play off the questions either, but I do want to hear as much as we can from everybody. And then if you have a follow-up question to the topic at hand, you're welcome to ask it, but that doesn't mean we're going to go after it. I may say, I'll tell you what, it's a good question, thank you, but we're going to move on. Okay? Is that David, fair? David, is that a pastor's? The preacher's two minutes? <laughs> no. no. This is an actual, yeah, an actual speaker's two minutes. You give a preacher two minutes, he's going to take 30. So that's, that we're going to limit it to two. That's the reason I have my phone. <clears throat> okay, first question, just right out of the box. And this is a question that came up two or three times. Um, women in ministry. Can women be pastors? <coughs> that's a good question. <laughs> we, we will differ. Okay? And, and I have... I'm still pondering, and I'll just speak for myself. I'm still pondering this. You will not find women elders specifically in Scripture. Uh, that's just the case. You will not find uh, a number of different kinds of, as far as pastor teachers go, you will not find them mentioned in Scriptures. Now, having said that, I think there's a great deal to be said about uh, the whole subject yet. I, I like to move slow, slowly in terms of change and church things, mm -hmm. but I do believe that women have a significant place in ministry in the kingdom of God. How that all washes out and comes out, I, I'm not altogether sure. Some of the greatest teachers I've ever sat under were women. I, I, there are several women that I read after because they're just terrific. So, having said all that, and I just soon have my daughters pray for anybody that anybody I've ever known. Mm -hmm. Christy, among them. Christy's one of the best teachers I've ever been around. So, uh, I, 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 I think that, I think that there can be, I'm not an egalitarian and I'm not a, a hierarchical, so to me it's kind of a muddle right now. Uh, in the place where we are in the church. I can see myself, I can see God gifting women to do wonderful things within ministry. So that's about where I am with that. Um, so <coughs> Jack may find it surprising. I agree with everything that he said. Um, I must be right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a couple of quick points on this for me. Uh, First, it seems fairly clear from the requirements of eldership in Titus and Timothy that women cannot serve as, um, as officers in that sense in the church. It's a separate issue whether they can teach in the church and whether they have other ministries in the church. Uh, I do believe there can and should be women deacons. Some people consider that highly controversial. I don't. But in fact, I think there's a strong yeah. biblical basis for that. Um, I would also say, now some that are sort of strictly uh, complementarian or objective hierarchical wouldn't, wouldn't even like the concessions that I just made. So I do want to be fair. I don't think it's a coincidence that historically most of the church has seen the office of elder or leader in the church, the principal leadership in the church, to be men. It's hard for me to believe the Holy Spirit would have led them and they would have been wrong on everything. Uh, but there are sections of the church, including the Pentecostal more recently historically and others that have given the women more of a leadership role. So for me, it's not so much leadership per se as it is the office of an elder shepherd overseeing the flock. That to me, it seems, and I'm open to change on this, but it seems also to be, um, to be the case. The final point about one second, one point. Uh, Having said all of that, I want to say one more thing, which is we live in an age that strongly emphasizes feminism. And some of that is very good because the previous age was actually strongly, uh, much too, quote, patriarchal. But you want, in my view, we need to be very careful adjusting the faith at a time when the culture also just happens to be stressing something. So you always want to check yourself. Are we, are we changing the Bible just to fit in with cultural norms? So I don't know if any of that made any sense, but that's my view. Craig or Doug? Well, I was gonna, the only thing I was going to say is, you know, you say, can they be? Well, in our denomination, they are. So obviously they can. I mean, in, in, one, in one sense. 
Uh, but I, I agree with these guys in terms of, uh, and, and many of them are very, very capable. You'd be, it's, it's just, there's no denying that. The question then just becomes, is it, um, for me, is it, is it, is it a biblical situation? I, I would disagree with my, with pretty much my whole denomination. I'm, I'm, I'm the rare person in our denomination that would say no. I disagree with them. Uh, it's never it, and I, I don't. I think it, I, I agree. I mean, I, I look at it from a biblical standpoint, essentially the way these two uh, uh, men have have described it. Uh, I I don't have any problem staying with my church over that issue. That's not something where. Uh, where I go, well, you know what? If that keeps on going, I'm leaving my denomination. I I don't do that. I, I I have I have regular fights with my best friend who pastors a very large church, and and and, uh, and we we've, we've got into some public debates about it. Uh, he he agrees. He believes one way. I believe another. But um, so that's my perspective. In our denomination, they do, and a lot of them are very capable. More capable, some of our men. Um, but uh, whether that whether it is a biblical structure is a whole different answer. And in that, I would simply say I don't see it, but I, I'm with these guys. Okay. Can, wait, can I just add one little thing here? Sure. It's obvious in Scripture that women may pray and prophesy. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's obvious. There are women who are called prophets. We sometimes say prophetess, but actually the Greek word is just prophet. Mm -hmm. Hannah was a prophet. She's mm -hmm. called that. Others were called prophets. So in terms of ministry gifts and ministry to the body of Christ, this is a little bit of a different thing than leadership role in uh, pastoral leadership. Or governance. Or, yeah, yes. that, that's even better. Yeah. That's even better. But so you, you see crossovers here uh, in Scripture. Is anybody wrong there? No, no, no. no, no I agree. The, word, the word officer, I think, is a nice nuance. Yes. Uh, and, and let's also not forget that the two the two events that mark the, the, the life of Christ, his birth and his resurrection. Mary and right. Mary, you have the first you have Mary chosen, you have Mary the first evangelist. So right. I can't think of another, if you will, religion that honors women as much as Christianity does. Um, all right. Uh, that was a softball, so let's move on. Uh, do, you, do you believe that God will judge all humans after the same standard? For example, will he judge someone who grew up in a little village in Africa where they've never heard about Jesus? The same way as God will judge me who grew up knowing the Lord and all of his commandments. Will God use the same measure to judge us? No, it won't. I mean, uh, Jesus himself talked about the servant that knew to do right uh, would be judged more severely than the servant that didn't. Uh, know to do right and didn't do right uh, but nonetheless God will judge so ignorance is not an excuse but excellent question no those of us the Bible is quite clear in the principle that those who have greater knowledge have greater responsibility mm -hmm. one area says that is those of us that are teachers this is why Paul kind of says I'm paraphrasing it's a really scary thing mm -hmm. to be a teacher in the church because we'll be judged more severely and that principle holds true in other areas so I'm just a little warning to everybody yes the fact that you're hearing all this truth Yes, God will judge you more severely if you turn away from it. I would say that, you know, in the Protestant tradition, we're very nervous about natural theology. Um, but, uh, but Paul, David talks about it in the Old Testament, you know, the sun going across declares the glory of God. And Paul picks up that, uh, that same theme in Romans where he said he, that somehow, I don't understand how, but somehow when you look out at the world as it's created, that even the Godhead uh, is is communicated in some way. So there's no, it seems to be, uh, I think, I agree, I don't think that everybody's gonna be judged on the same, I mean, if you know more, you're, you're, you're judged by more, but everybody is, ultimately everybody is judged through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and, and that standard is for everyone, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Read Roman 22. Absolutely crystal clear that God will judge every man, mm -hmm. whether you have the law or do not have the law. Amen. It starts right there. Mm -hmm. Jew and Gentile alike are judged at exactly the same standard. The Jew more because he has more knowledge. The Gentile by the knowledge that he has. Mm -hmm. And then Paul says this remarkable mm -hmm. statement that every person really knows yes. God. They really know that there is a God. 
that he is, and they, they know his eternal attributes, his power, his might. And those who resist that, and that's the term, they resist that knowledge, they will, and but we will all be judged. So you, you, you say, well, and by the way, this is not a judge, it is a judgment of works in a sense. In a sense, all men are judged, we will all give an account of our works. But that's not the same thing as being uh, trusting in Christ. Because the judgment, if we are trusting in Jesus, the final judgment has already been spoken over us. What is it? Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So on that final day, I'm thinking about it. Can I, I had a little vision the other time. Not a not, not vision like that. But I saw in my mind's eye all the billions of people who ever lived on this planet. And I thought, oh. I just went crazy thinking about it. And then I saw myself, and I, I said, Jack, it, it, I, I fear the Lord. I, I have an awe of the sense of all God. It's, it, 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 now I may be wrong here. This, I'm just showing it out here. I saw myself as the only person there. It's as if, no, because I can't ever say, well, my mother made me do it. <laughs> you know, no, I'm there by myself. I will give an account of my life to God. And it will be as if I'm the only person there, but you know what? I'm going to hang on to Jesus. I'm clinging to Him. And you know what Father's going to say to me? I see you in my Son. Amen. Oh, ooh, that's good enough for me. <laughs> um, there are debates amongst Christians regarding the book of Genesis. There are some who say that Adam and Eve is poetry, that Genesis 1 and 2 is poetry. And should be regarded and should not be regarded as um, history. And there are others who will say that Genesis one two is historical. That should be six. It should be seen as six, twenty four hour days. How do we interpret this? Boy, I'm glad you guys are here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my my view, uh, Genesis is definitely historical. Um, I think that there's no question that creation is largely poetic language, but the poetry itself is based on actual historical events. Um, I think it's imperative. Somebody mentioned Adam and Eve. This is vital. Um, if Adam and Eve are not actual historical figures, then the gospel of Jesus Christ is in peril. I'll tell you why. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, Paul draws a remarkable analogy between the first Adam, Adam in the garden, and Jesus Christ. And what the first Adam lost in his disobedience, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, wins in his obedience. Uh, Jesus Christ himself uh, clearly believed that Adam and Eve were historical figures. Uh, the question about the days, whether they're actual literal days, um, I believe they are. Now, is that the most important thing to understand about Genesis? I don't think so. But I would say this, and then I'll be done. Let these other guys talk and correct my errors, I'm sure. Um, the important thing is a creational Genesis worldview. Mm -hmm. Creational norms, that the norms are established. The creator-creature distinction. Man and woman created a mago day in the image of God. God created man and woman, both in the image of God. There are two. There aren't like, three, there aren't like 17 genders. There are only two sexes, man and woman. The Dominion Commission, or we call the cultural mandate. The Sabbath. These are what I'd like to call creational norms, creational law. Those are more important than any specific interpretation of Genesis, though I'm fully committed to the literal view. I'm not. But I'm not fully committed to the literal view. Okay? I believe that Genesis 1 through 3 is the most important probably the most important chapters in all of that. I think that every theme in Scripture you can find in Genesis 1 through 3. And the reason I'm not totally committed to the six-day, literal, you know, young day, you know, 24 hours, mm -hmm. is because it seems to me more broad than that. And so I hold it loosely, okay? I grew up with the 
uh, absolutely six day, you know, six day creation. World was created in 4004 BC at nine o'clock in the morning. That's what Dr. Rusher believed. And you, and I don't I, I don't say that in ridicule at all, at all. Because these are men who have studied chronology really carefully, and they use. But in the last few years, and I'll just uh, and I'm probably wrong, and I'll probably stand before the Lord and say, "You did what? You believed what? <laughs> you little idiot, you!" you know? But at this point, I, I, I see it more in terms of of uh, more poetry, but poetry that reveals the greatest cosmos thing that you can possibly imagine. <coughs> now, I, I'm I'm ready to be proved wrong. I stand ready to be proved wrong, but right, I just have to tell you, right now, I, I go back and forth. I, I just have, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a literal six-day guy, and, and uh, I, I like to call it mature Earth creation rather than young Earth, more than anything, uh, because I believe that God created a real Adam and a real Eve, and then when Adam was created, he was created instantaneously, that God literally did it the way he said he did it, and breathed the breath of life into him, and Adam became a living soul, and that part forward. And, and then I, I also believe that God gave us some genealogies that are uh, pretty strong. Um, I just, in fact, I just worked with a friend of mine, or I didn't work with him, he did all the work. I, I got all the benefit of, of, his, uh, of his research that, would, that I think uh, God placed in there specifically to help us. Um, the, uh, but I, I can, as long as people are talking about um, a, a real Adam, what, what happens uh, so often and, uh, uh, is that uh, when you start to take it back beyond that, um, where it, what, it's, what many people is trying to, from my perspective, is trying to, you try to um, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, Pastor Jack, but because uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to disagree with this more. No, but, but the, you know, a lot of times we're trying to make accommodation to a evolutionary worldview. I'm not and um, no, I, no, I, no, but uh, the but what um, but what happens is is that we, we forget that the Babylonians and the Egyptians had far better uh, stories on evolution than Darwin ever came up with. Uh, the Babylonians believed that the Earth was like you know, 400 billion years old and that everything he bought, I mean, essentially they were the pre-Darwin Darwins. Um, and, um, and the, and Genesis had every chance, I mean, uh, Moses had every chance in the world to write along those lines in terms of following that type of thing if he wanted just to be poetry and liter literary uh, structure. And he did, he wrote something that went every, every bit against the grain. I mean, it blew aside every other, every other world view and said God created uh, and so th that's where I come from and, and uh, but I, I have a, a lot of my friends who would disagree with me on that but I just um, I've always felt like it was important for me uh, to, to defend that uh, and to talk about that uh, from that perspective because in my ministry especially when I was right up next to Michigan State University and, and evolutionary theory was prevalent in everything that we did. And um, I, just, I just hate what evolutionary theory uh, that it uh, has done and how it's devalued man and, and creation and, and everything else. So that's just from my perspective. Now you're showing the most wisdom tonight. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, along those lines, since we're talking about creation and evolution, um, how do you reconcile that with dinosaurs? Do I really? I just, I mean, that was a that was a, a question that came up. In addition, how do we how do we deal with dinosaurs when it comes to? Well, that's not in the Bible, so. I, well, Craig's done more work on this than I have. I, I I think I've read everything that the Creation Science Institute's done. I know the Morrises. I've read them all. I, those kind of things. Uh, and I don't have a problem with, with it, and, and, and despite a, a little sense of the things I wrestle with, okay? And I wrestle with this, and I don't always win. Sometimes I can't win <laughs> I just, sometimes I come and I say, well, you know, I just don't really know. Okay, so, but, my, my I, I have no problem at all. I, I like chronology, I like all those things, I've, 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 I've looked at them, but, my question has been, is that really what God wanted to, to uh, speak to us? 
in Genesis 1 through 3, particularly, well, Genesis 1 through 11. Is that what God was, is that the thing he wanted us to see? And, and, and uh, you know, or to, or to wrestle. Now, evolutionary thing, that's a totally different thing. Darwinism is a false, it is filled with holes. Anybody who looks for at it from any angle would say Darwinism is ridiculous. And of course, it's social Darwinism that has taken over today, and that is evil to the max because it's rude as evil. But I always say, is that what God said? Is that what He intended for me to know? That He intended me to say, well, okay, this was, you know, go back, whatever it was, and, and say, this is how He did it. Could he do it that way? Well, absolutely. I have no problem with that at all. But I also don't want to say that all the science that's been looked at over the years is all ridiculous. So there are all scientists who are trying to prove a point. I'm not sure that's the case. So that's just where I am here. So dinosaurs, I don't know about. Well, on, on dinosaurs, di the, the, the word dinosaur, of course, is our, is our new word. I mean, right <coughs> now, it's not like, uh, but the, um, you know, dinosaur, the average the average size of a dinosaur, by the way, the way that we categorize them, was actually less than 18 inches. I mean, that's the typical size of a dinosaur. There's very few of the really gigantic ones, and most of the gigantic ones they build that off from one or two bones. There's a few that are built off more than that, but but for the most part, I mean, you know, you can some things never stop growing. Like if an alligator is left alone, it'll grow forever. It never no, stops. We know that around here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you had yeah. The other day I saw one in Florida that it was a, it was 15 feet and 700 pounds, and I mean, you know, so there's all sorts of things, and uh, that you know that um, you know that 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 you know that the flood <coughs> there was you know there would have been many that would have been extinguished during the flood, um, you know, but um, you know I, I think that um, so often we we place uh, too much emphasis on what you know what people are telling us happened before it's like I, I was joking with these guys you know kind of my life's uh, goal is to get Christians at least Christians to stop calling oil uh, fossil fuel it's not fossil fuel it's carbon um, even the U University of Oklahoma uh, where they do all the study on oil uh, they're finding out that old oil fields that have been drained are refilling with brand new oil and it's better than what it was and the head of the Department of Oil in Oklahoma, not a Christian, at least I know of, he was, this is Wall Street Journal, said that uh, there couldn't have been enough dead dinosaurs, no matter how long you go back, uh, to, uh, to make all the oil that we've been pumping out of the ground for the last 150 years, uh, 120 years or so. And so, um, you know, see, you can see how, how easy it permeates everything and how just by calling something a dinosaur that might have just been a creature, all of a sudden it kind of changes our, our thinking. But that's not to deny that we haven't found some strange looking creatures, but every year we, we hear that things go extinct. In fact, they're always trying to say, you know, you guys heard about the, about the, what, the, the passenger pigeon or the whatever? Right, right. So, you know, that's, that was a small one. I mean, that's a small animal, but, you know, I mean, 500 years from now, they could say, well, that was a dinosaur. I mean, I, I don't know, just something like that. There are a couple of unusual creatures mentioned in the yeah. Bible and in English are translated the uh, behemoth mm -hmm. and um, Leviathan. Uh, Hebrew scholars will say we don't know exactly what they were, but they, they could correspond to what we call dinosaurs. So were, were dinosaurs around, particularly before the flood, maybe after? Certainly, very possible. Mm -hmm. But they just become extinct? Certainly. That doesn't somehow overthrow the Bible's account of how right. it came into being. Do y'all consider plastic surgery a sin, since it would be voluntarily changing your body? Would it fall in the same category as a voluntary sex change? How do you feel about it? Because if I could change some of my features, I probably should. <laughs> I, I think, oh hey, it sounds like apples and oranges to me. Uh, sex change is a heck of a lot different from having my nose fixed. Does that make any sense to you? Can we, can we tease those apart then? Can uh, we not only can we, we must. So, we want. Okay. so let's talk about cosmology. Cosmology is the way the world is structured. Right. Genesis lays down a cosmology. The cosmology is there are males and females and nothing else, that's no it. remainder. That's it. Males and females, that's all. Now plastic surgery is, let's say in the case of a female, to, to work on to correct certain
parts of the female as a female. Right. Um, uh, sex change and sex reassignment or sexual autonomy, some of it, the, the, the language is, is changing, mm -hmm. sexual autonomy, surgery and so on, is the attempt to tamper with the cosmology. It's the attempt, as it were, in the, in the, the spiritual cosmological realm, the sexual realm, to overturn, just like attempt to overturn gravity. Now, I'm, what I'm saying is very important. I want each of you to listen to it carefully. You can't tamper with the cosmology. You cannot tamper with the way God structured the world. Um, another example is you're created in the image of God. To attempt to turn man into something other than God's image is horrific evil. Man is inherently created in the image of God and created as male and female, equally important, equally in the image of God. In fact, I would go so far to say, is you, in fact, I know I believe the Bible teaches, you can't have just the male and see the full image of God. God is imaged both in both male and female, and you can't get the full sense of God apart from both of them. But there is no third. There is no third at all. And to do that is to overturn, try to overturn God's created order. It's very dangerous, and it's very destructive, and it's really an attempt to destroy God's world. Not to put too fine a point on it. No, no, this is absolutely true. Uh, we've used words, we use them today and yesterday. Autonomy. I can't just get up one morning and say, well, I think I'm a woman. Or I think I'm a hippopotamus. And, uh, you know, there's a lady out in Arizona who says, I'm a hippopotamus. <laughs> no, she, you aren't. Now, if, if she really thinks that, she has a mental illness. Exactly. Uh, as well as being, well, it's just absurd. It, it, this, and so if you think that you're autonomous, number one, that you're in error there, right right there. We belong to God. We, we, so uh, when I said they're apples, they're more than that. They're like apples and... Lawn furniture. Yes, <laughs> sir. There's no, there's no way to, uh, you know, if my nose needs to get fixed, let's, and I can fix it. And my nose probably needs to be fixed. I'm not going to do that, but I mean, I would say, that's plastic surgery as I'm thinking of it, okay? But gender things, <laughs> yeah. That is a whole different ballgame. And it's, it's evil. Could I add something? Craig, I don't want to jump in here. Can I add one thing? Sure. So it's a Gnostic idea, I don't have time to describe it, that there's a person inside you, and the body is sort of like the vehicle for carting around the real person. But see, I'm not looking at your shell. I'm looking at you, and you're looking at me. Which is to say, your sexual organs are part of you. There's not a real person inside that can autonomously say, well, I want to reinvent myself if I'm a male, that male sexual organs, as a female, or vice versa. There's, you are the, per, the person, your body is a part of the person. The person isn't like really the true person isn't living inside. That's an ancient Greek idea, and that's a false idea. God made us as a unitary being. By the way, that's why the resurrection is very important. The resurrection proves that. Mm -hmm. Um, can I go off that question? Sure, you can. What do you got? Um, so I see what you're saying about like sex change is totally different from like just plastic surgery. Like, but what if you change like you get so much work done that you're barely recognizable from how God created you? You're still. Uh, it's interesting when Jesus kind of implicitly dealt with that. He says from the beginning God made them male and female. So. There's this idea, this was said a number of years ago, that uh, biology is not destiny. Oh, yes, it is. It is destiny. It is destiny. So it, it doesn't matter how much of a sex change operation. If you're born as a male, it doesn't matter what operation. You're still a male mm -hmm. or vice versa, a female. Mm -hmm. In other words, what your birth is is what you are. But, well, I think what she was asking is, is it, um, I think that's a given for you. Mm -hmm. What she was asking, and I'm kind of curious. Is there too much say, plastic yeah, plastic it's, surgery? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, it's, 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 it's like a sin to like change how God created you. It looks oh, like how you look, look yeah. and like yes. to where you are barely recognizable. Yeah. It's one thing to fix your nose, but we, we're seeing people in the culture now who are doing everything. Yeah. 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 You know why that is? Like Kenny Rogers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Would you like to know why that is? People want to stay perpetually young, and they're afraid of death, and they don't believe in the aging process, and it largely grew out, not entirely, but largely grew out of Hollywood and the obsession with appearance. So yes, 
I'm not saying that if there's some particular deformity or something, the Bible doesn't specifically say it's wrong, but the, the quest for the lust for youth, and particularly youthful appearance, that is a sinful, lustful desire. It's wrong. It's, it, at its core, it's idolatry. It is idolatry. Yeah. And, and there, there's always those dangers. And, and we should always ask, just because you can, is that what you should? And yeah. the Christian, we have to ask, what, what does the Bible say? And is this simple? So absolutely. <laughs> Along those lines, since we're dealing with cultural issues, uh, is it okay to use contraception? How about artificial insemination? What about freezing embryos? Wow. Wow. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Oh boy. <laughs> uh, I have wrestled <laughs> with all these things. Uh, uh, I, I, I used to think that, I mean, I, I grew up thinking immediately that uh, contraception was perfectly fine. Okay? And then I began to rethink that. I, I really did. I began to rethink it. And, and I, I did it on the basis of of God's command to be fruitful and multiply. Now I know that that's not necessarily mean that I, but I, 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 if I had to, I'd come down now on the side of no contraception. That, that'd just be me, okay? I, and I can't necessarily say that's, now if you're a Roman Catholic, that's the side you come down on. You know, there is no, if or ands or buts in Roman Catholic theology at all. Uh, Sometimes they'll have what they call the rhythm method and so on, but it's still a form of contraception, you know, and so by, by being too hard here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, but but they, they, they don't <coughs> artificial, I, I'll use that one. They don't uh, permit any kind of artificial contraception. Okay. Now, I think many kinds of artificial, and the, the reason I began to rethink this is because almost all, and maybe all, artificial uh, has a form of abortion connected to it. And that is wrong. When does life begin? Not when the child is born. At the very instant of conception. When an egg and a sperm meet, that is a human being. Not the woman's body. It's a human being. And it obviously had to start at the very moment of conception. So if there's an artificial something or other that interrupts that artificially, then I have to wonder if that is not a form of abortion. So that's where I've come on some of these things. Okay. Now, am I going to tell somebody, well, you know, this is sin. I, I, I'm not sure about that one, but I do. Can, can you follow my, my line of reasoning mm -hmm. a little bit? Okay, so, so, uh, we decided that we would not use any further forms of contraception. Uh, we have five children, and my wife stopped having children. And I was, uh, and she knew, and she couldn't bear it anymore. And it, it wouldn't have anything to do with, with uh, contraception or whatever. But uh, so, and, and I know what they were going to have one child, and that's it, or two or three or whatever. But, but I think it's important that we not, and, and, and the abortion thing is a child despising thing. No, absolutely. They don't, they don't like children. It's, you know, it's almost like a disease. That's right. And that's not biblical. That's wrong. So that's my two cents worth, okay? So, uh, yeah, I agree with, in general, all that, Jack, excellent. So I don't think while the Bible would specifically forbid contraception in every case, in my book, The Christian Sexual Worldview, I'm going to hawk a book. Is that okay, Dave? Sure. You can go online, Amazon, to The Christian Sexual Worldview. I put the Bible certainly opposes recreational contraception. Mm -hmm. There's also something else. You know about the sexual revolution essentially started in the 60s. It certainly intensified it. I do have to agree with our Roman Catholic friends that the sexual revolution in the United States, actually, it's pretty easy to prove it really began with a wide sale uh, introduction of contraception. True. I mean, you really break uh, off the association 
between the sexual act and bringing children into the world, and that, by the way, that's only accelerated. It's only accelerated more and more and more. Then that's how the sexual revolution essentially happened. Have a sex, have sex with anybody you want to, anytime you want to. Don't worry about pregnancy. You can see that association. I want to mention quickly. There was a question about um, artificial, artificial, artificial insemination and all that. I've changed yeah, yeah. my view on that. I'm much uh, stricter uh, in opposition to many of those things. Um, and I don't know if you know about that, particularly on the West Coast, the surrogate to motherhood, you know about that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, bearing someone else's children, that's what the <coughs> Asians will often, not just Asians, it's not a racial thing. Uh, they'll often say, well, if you'll to, to a woman who's very healthy, then we place a fertilized egg in your body, and then when the child's born, give it back, and we'll pay you forty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 for that. This is really popular in California. And egg harvesting, young college students, oh, you young ladies, you will pay $30,000 to have your college debt if we can get your eggs. That is really contrary to God's creational order, and that's the issue for me. Yeah, that's it. Now, a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute. I mean, wouldn't you agree that medical procedures can be used? I mean, oh, yes, to enhance human health, to enhance natural birth, even cesarean section, of course that's fine. But most of these other things are actually designed to, to circumvent the way God intended for children to come into the world. You see the difference between those two? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to enhance and help children come into the world in the way God intended. And on the other hand, to create new ways for children to come into the world. That is a subversion of uh, the creation order. Can I, can I ask you to make a distinction, or if you see a distinction, between a surrogate, which is outside of marriage, and a couple having infertility issues and, and some of those measures within the confines of, of their own marriage, their own genetic Excellent material. Distinction. Yeah, that, uh, the one you put your finger on, that is the only one where I think it might be a possibility because it's a husband and a wife, mm -hmm. and they can't have children. That, I agree, it's not to be put into the surrogacy category. <laughs> However, having said that, I would be very cautious because in the Word of God, what was the recourse when people couldn't have children? Well, God opened and shuts the womb. They pray. And they pray. And there's always the possibility of adoption. But I don't disagree with you. I would not classify what you're talking about, about within a marriage, artificial insemination within a marriage. That certainly would not be morally classifiable with uh, the surrogacy, surrogacy in other cases. So, yeah, great, great distinction. I agree with that. Can I go off of that question really quickly? Uh, so... Would it be wrong to seek medical treatment rather than pray, or do both? Like, I don't. If God has given us as a society the ability to medically handle something such as like not infertility, kid. yeah, infertility. Yeah, no, I don't think it's wrong. It's an either or thing. But I think you should. I think definitely. I think you should pray first, then trust God first. And if you can pray and get peace before God, and it's not contrary to the Word of God. Um, I don't think specifically that taking fertility medication, although, by the way, there is tend to be risk of taking that uh, medication. Um, so, but the, the, the key distinction is medicines that are designed to assist in the natural way God intended, those are to be separated from circumventing the way that God intended for children to come into the world. That's very, very different. Mm -hmm freezing uh, embryos and so on. That's very different. Of course, since we're talking about, obviously, the child and families and all, what is uh, what input do we have from the scripture about marriage in the sense of age? Can you, is there such things being too young? Well, 13 may be too, too young. Huh? <laughs> uh, no, uh, no. If you, listen, read history. Just read history. Well, my my grandmother. <coughs> now, I, I'm not saying these are things. My grandmother was 14 when she married Mr. Carter. Oh wow. He was 30. Oh. oh. <laughs> In Tennessee, <laughs> they came to they came to Dallas in a covered wagon. She called him Mr. Carter their entire marriage. <laughs> they had six children. <coughs> they had a wonderful. Now, I'm, I'm not putting that up as well. I'm just telling you, read history. That's not historically unprecedented. In fact, it's I would not, say most of history marriages were that way. It's not, it's not only not unprecedented, it was the way they did this. Right. First of all, men didn't get married usually at about 30 because they needed to be 
able to take care of a family, uh -huh. That's right. able to provide for a, for a wife. And they wanted young women because they're more fertile. Just that simple. And it just that's it really is. And so it happens. It ha my wife was 17, I was 20. Now, my pastor said, my I was, in, I was a junior in college, middle of my the prince of the uh, president of the school called me in, I knew him well. He said, Jack, maybe you ought to put this off. Uh, you need to finish college, you're gonna go to seminary, da, da. everything I was told was right. <laughs> Everything. They were right. I mean, it, what, was it risk as far as statistics go? Yes, sir. It was a risk. It was a risk. Well, 65 years later, here we are. Oh, that's you awesome. know? So, and, and, and it, we were just trying to be foolish about this. It seemed right to both of us. I, I, it took me a year more to finish college, all those kinds of things. You know, I, I went to work. So I'm just saying, there's no, there's no biblical thing. You have to be 25, 21. Those, those are artificial ages in our time that were not in historically a much less biblical time. How old do you think Mary was? Yeah, 13. Quite young. Quite young. We don't know how young, but she wasn't old. I'm not mad at Mary. The mother, the mother of the Lord. So would you like to know then why everybody's kind of, oh, when they heard Pastor Kurt, oh, wow. So what has changed historically? Yeah. You know what's changed historically? It's not that women are now become fertile much older. No. It's what has happened is the notion of uh, adulthood, childhood, when people are, quote, allegedly ready for marriage, mm -hmm. maturity. Essentially, and I hope this is an exception for everybody here, <laughs> um, a lot of times 14, 15, 16-year-olds were a lot more mature than 25 and 30-year-olds. In history. In history. In history. In history. In history. Yeah. Today. Now today, as you well know, it's like, well, you know, I'm going to wait until 35, 40, and then I'll be in a position to get married. Now, young ladies, I want to tell you something. You can do that. It's not unbiblical. But God actually made young women to get married and to be healthily have children. My wife had children. Uh, her last one was when you're 26, 27, 28 years old. He made your body, in general, to have children in your 20s. Now, can you have them? Sure, 30s, sure. sure. And even sometimes 40s. Right. But you can't, fight, you can't fight biology, which is to say you can't fight the creation order. Now, what the Bible, and now I'm dealing with spiritual issues. The notion that we're all going to get our careers totally in order, and we're all going to have a fun time, we're all going to travel the world, and, you know, I'm 35 and 40, and then we're going to settle down, and then I'll have married and have a nice little child and a wife to fence and so on. There's nothing <laughs> biblical about that. So if that's your attitude, you will never be ready to be married. I agree with what Pastor Carter said. It's very good, particularly young men, to be able to support a family. Yeah. That's very, very important. But the notion that, well, I have to be making six figures, uh, you know, and have two automobiles and all that sort of thing, that's just, that's, that's, an, that's an American myth. That's a consumerist myth. Get married if you can, if God gives you that opportunity and have children. That's, that is a creational norm too, getting married and having children. Read Genesis 1, 28 to 30. And that's the order. That's the order. Getting, right, getting married and then having children. That's the order. Uh, and I think you guys can speak to this. Guy and Beth here can speak to this. I'll speak to this. There is something about getting married young and going through those struggles with a partner Amen. together that bring the marriage, that solidify that marriage. I mean, it just, there is. So rather than waiting until I'm going to be perfect in this kind of thing, no, you, you go through it now in order that you can then, you, you come through it. You just do. Wouldn't, I mean, that's, isn't it better to go through it with somebody than by yourself? I think it is. So don't just stand there. Yeah, don't just stand there. <laughs> <Mary. laughs> so, so here's what happens when you get married from there. Right, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> What happens is this other person has yeah. yeah. become yeah. part of your life story, if I may say so. Yeah. I can't conceive of my life, what it has been without my wife. Uh, I certainly hope that she outlives me. Um, we can't guarantee that. But the point is, but the point is, you, David, I, I could not have put it better, Dave. Absolutely right. God melds lives together. When you get married and you're young, you go through hardships. Emotional hardships and financial hardships, hardships with, the chil uh, hardships with the children, and on and on. And that melds your lives together. And so when the, the, even the hint of divorce comes up, well, I'm not going to divorce my wife. 
she's, she's part of my life. This is my life. I'm not going to divorce my life. To divorce her would be like divorcing myself. So think about that. Now, that's not autonomous reasoning. Autonomous reasoning is just have a started marriage or sleep with somebody for a few years and go to somebody else. There's nothing biblical about that. None whatsoever. I do. I just want to caveat that and say that sure. if you do things in order, then they're easier. Yes. So if you finish school, it'll be easier to do before mm -hmm. getting married. If you Enjoy. get married and you <coughs> have children, it will be easier to have the children. If you have children before marriage, it's going to be a lot harder. Absolutely. If you do any of those things like out of order, they're just going to be a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. well, so what she's really saying is you, you're not supposed to have sex before marriage. <laughs> So that's one thing, you shouldn't be having children before marriage. Yeah, this is off that topic, but, uh, but the, the, the other thing is, is what most people don't realize, a lot of, uh, especially a lot of young people have been taught that children are wealth uh, destroyers. Uh, that's, not the, that's not the case. The, the, uh, studies, they're not Christian studies, they're just studies across, anywhere there's freedom. I'm not talking about social, you know, communist countries or, or, or things of that nature, but in, in all of the free countries, I mean, the, uh, there have been studies after studies after studies, and basically, I'll just give you this, the, the short of it, uh, married couples uh, earn more, uh, married men uh, make more money than unmarried men, sure. uh, even if they're living, even if there's a man and woman living together, uh, men with lots of children make a lot more money than people with a few children. That's why I had a lot of kids. Something happened with me. I'm the, I'm, I'm <laughs> but, but, the, but the reality is, is that, that, that they have found statistically through, I mean, through very, very, uh, I mean, uh, lots of different studies, is that literally children end up being, uh, they, they serve as wealth creators. Absolutely. And, and what, they, what they surmise is, is that people who have a lot of children, they're future oriented. For, for instance, they don't take off a day to go to the beach because of, you know maybe a man has a job. He goes, boy, I, got, I better go to work. So he goes to work because More he's productive. there yeah. and he's and he's responsible. They, he gets a promotion, okay, and then he starts to think about his children's future. And so all of this has led to really a wealth. You you have children who are wealth generators. They are they are not wealth destroyers, and that that's something that that really should be um, should be. Uh, shared with with young people, they, the children are real, really are a blessing from God. They're in the inheritance of the Lord. Amen. I agree. Very good. Let me, if we could, we we talked a lot about uh, cultural issues. Let me turn it back in on on scripture. Um, universalism, the idea that in the end God saves everybody. Not true. No. <laughs> that was easy. That was easy. Now. I believe, again, I have read every one of the universalist arguments, and some of them are pretty good. Uh, there are some men that have written very, very, very uh, well, because there are, there wouldn't be the concept of universalism if there weren't some places in scripture that look like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just all there is to it. Or, or you could reason it a certain way. Universalism that everybody ultimately will be saved. That, that's the yeah. Okay. Now, I, I've, I've read it as a bit. One time I used to say, well, I wish that were the case, but I've stopped doing that. I've stopped doing that. Now, neither do I believe. I am not a Calvinist in the sense that God creates men to go to hell. I don't I believe agree. that. I agree, I, 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 I agree with that. I, I repel, I, I, I'm repulsed by that idea. Mm -hmm. That a God who is a God of compassion would actually create people and say, I created them to spend the eternity in hell. I think that's absurd. Mm -hmm. That's right. I don't think about, well, I don't think the Bible teaches it. If it and, I, and I say this, if, if the Bible teaches it, it's right. right. And I'll mm -hmm. say God is right and I'm wrong. Okay? But I don't think that's what the Bible says. Okay, so... But I also do not believe that the Bible says that all men, and here's why. First of all, I don't think it's clearly taught in, it's clearly taught in Scripture that there are some who go to hell. They are cast into the lake of fire. I, I think that's true. I had a brother one time said, well, that's God's way to cleanse the people. They got cleansed in the fire, and then they went all to heaven. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like it to me. No. Okay. Number two, I believe that there is such that God made us with real wills. Okay. Real, volitional. 
a part of our identity as the Imago Dei is abolition. God wills, we will. God has reason, we have reason. God has all these things. We are made as if, and I think it's real. I think our choices mean something. We're not automatons. I believe that we, and so therefore, I, I, I take, actually, this is the position of most of the church. From the earliest, there were a few men in there. Origen believed that, uh, early church father, that all men were going to be, but almost all believed that there were real wills involved. C.S. Lewis is kind of a, a guy who was all in that. He, he, he says, well, uh, men will not be, you know, Jesus said, you will not come to be that you might have life. And so I think God found it, and David and I have used this forever and ever. <laughs> C.S. Lewis said there are only two kinds of people at the end of time. They either hear God says, we, we, say to, we say to God, your will be done. God says to us, your will be done. You will not be saved. Not that you cannot be. Not that I chose you for hell, but that you will not be saved. So that's where I come down this. And I, th I think universalism is not only a mistake uh, in, in, in theology and handling the scripture, but I think it can lead to some bad stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I that. Uh, good. Make any sense to you? What about in terms of the supernatural? Why do you think it is that the Western culture church seems to see so few supernatural miracles? We talk a lot about it. It's in scripture. We don't seem to see a lot of it here in the United States, and that which we do seems to be a poor representation of what we find in the Bible. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. I think mm -hmm. the, uh, one reason is we lack faith. We don't expect that. Yeah. We're a heavenly enlightenment rich culture, and I'm far from one who says that there haven't been any benefits of enlightenment. I mean, we have lights in here because of uh, Benjamin Franklin and other enlightenment premises. So, but I think that's one reason. Uh, somebody was mentioning earlier about Africa and Asia. Why do you have the reports of these? Well, because people tend to live in faith. Uh, the, uh, in the Western culture, uh, there has both been the, the benefit of uh, mechanism, enlightenment, and uh, the disenchantment of the world that is the animism that spirits are everywhere sort of in things. That's a good disenchantment. But there's the secular disenchantment that God is not here, the Holy Spirit is not here, that devils are not here. Oh, according to the Bible, they, they, they definitely are. So I think that's one of the main reasons. And one of the main reasons, little by little, the church has lost influence is because the church lacks faith to believe in the power of the supernatural. Now, does everybody that claims supernatural, like some somebody blows into town and says they're going to heal everybody and give everybody a million dollars, does that mean that's all legitimate? Well, of course not. But the fact that there is a travesty or a perversion of Christian truth doesn't mean that Christian truth isn't what it is, which is true. I, I heard it once said that... Um, that the idols of our culture, primarily sex, money, and power, we see deliverance from that, which would be, in, in a sense, supernatural. But in other countries, there's more of the, what we would identify, what we're talking about here is supernatural, more demonic, and that's what we see delivered in those countries. Do you think there's a correlation between the two? You were, you were alluding to some of that with the Enlightenment. Yeah, my view on that is slightly different. But I think that wherever Christian culture goes and Christianization, it tends to push Satan and satanic work to the edges. Yeah. And so I think the reason you don't or haven't in, in a, a more recent American history or from the beginning seen as much of that demonic possession as you did when Jesus showed up is precisely because we began as uh, largely, broadly, a Christianized culture. Now you're probably thinking ahead, but as Christianity were, if it were to recede and secularism were to gain a stronghold, I think you can expect to see more, much more demon possession. You think so, like for the future, that we can yes. be prepared, yeah. like yeah. here in America? Yeah, if, if there's not a great revival yeah. and great reformation. Yeah, absolutely. You, you always need to be prepared to deal with the reality of the demonic world. It's very real. It's very real. Uh, demons aren't everywhere. Satan doesn't know everything. He's not God. He never will be God. Uh, but the fact is, he is in this sense alive and well god still permits him although he is chained he can go so far and no and no further but demonic activity is real and when you face it head on you need to know what it is 
if a de if it's a demon that's doing this, you need to know, you need to be sure that you have scriptural ground, you understand that in the name of Jesus, we cast out demons. We resist them. We resist Satan. Uh, and this is not, you know, playtime either. Uh, I, I don't I don't like the, the, the demonic world. No. It's ugly. It, 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 it's ugly, but it's real. It's real. So, you we, again, we need to get really thoroughly biblically grounded. Understand that there is, we, we're in warfare. We talk about it. We are, we are born to battle. We were born to, and, and if we go around and think that there is no demon, there is no, no such thing, uh, and they always hide themselves. Satan always comes as an angel of light. You know, all these kind of, he's not, he's not going to say, hey, I'm the devil, I'm here to, Bring your life. No, he doesn't do that. That's right. But we need to understand his ways. Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. Mm -hmm. And we must not be ignorant. So don't go around with your head in the sand. Neither, as Lewis says, are two extremes. I quote Lewis a lot because he had good common sense. There are two extremes. Everything's a demon or nothing's a, That's right. That's right. a demon. Well, neither one's true. The extremes are not true, but it is true that there, there still is yet a battle, battles to be won, and, and in some circumstances, in some cultures, it's, it's more intense than others. Now, all of us here, every one of us here, I'm pretty sure, have had direct encounters with demonic things. Now, I have had a, a number of them in my life, and uh, I, I, I didn't like them then, I was glad to see uh, the person delivered and helped and, and healed. But not everything, most things in our day are not demons, but where they are, you need to know, come at them. Jesus gave you authority over unclean things. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's the bottom line. So use it, use your authority. Dave, quickly, and it almost goes without saying, but not quite. Don't play around with conjuring or reading oh, wars no. or anything <laughs> like that. Take totally away from that. Right. You may not take it seriously and think it's a joke, Satan takes it very seriously. Mm -hmm. Take totally away from that. Mm -hmm. In Leviticus 10, God strikes down the two sons of Aaron because he did not offer up a sacrifice honoring to God. But argued that God was too harsh with his punishment. Why does he offer so many chances for others who sin in what might appear to be greater than the sins of Aaron's sons? The actions of God does not appear to be that of a loving father that Scripture claims that he is. Also, do the sons of Aaron go to heaven? Is this incident a one-and-done ordeal? We talked about it. I hope you've been listening carefully to this brother. He said a lot of stuff over these days, and you'll need to digest it. One of the things that he has said, and we said it here, here tonight, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, the sons of Aaron were in line to be the high priests of Israel, especially the first two. Nadab was the next in line to succeed Aaron as the high priest. Now, those men had been set, they had already been set aside as holy unto God. Uh, you, you don't get more privilege than that. Holy unto God. And they offered, un, it's called unholy fire, which is uh, an interesting phrase. Well, I'm not altogether sure what that means. I mean, uh, help me here, but unholy fire. But they they should they knew better. They should have known better, and they did it anyway. And so there are times. Well, go to the New Testament. Think of Ananias and Sapphira. Okay. I mean, this isn't just an Old Testament. No, uh, you know you know that story. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what did they do? Well, they sold a piece of property, kept back part of it, and came and, and gave the rest of it as if it were the whole in order to get attention. Whatever, I don't know what their motivation was. Make them look better in the community. They'd have to buy you, maybe uh, have more authority. You know, all, but whatever the motivation was, they knew better, and they did it anyway. And Peter said, you, and then they lied about it. Remember the story? One at a time. And a nice first, and his dear wife Safari came in, and, and he dropped dead, and she dropped dead. And they died, and great fear came on the whole church.
So there are instances where God does something not unjust. This is not unjust. It's not not compassionate. It was absolutely in order. And the fear of God came on Israel, on the other two sons of Aaron, I might add, and on Aaron himself, again. And the, the, we're told the fear of God came on the church of Jesus Christ. Again, uh, again I refer to C.S. Lewis. I refer to Aslan. Is he a tame lion? No, but he's good. Everything God does is good. So, I don't judge God's actions. God, you would answer. Uh, we were just reading and talking earlier today, um, reading just a couple verses from Isaiah's book. Oh, good. This read is Isaiah on. 66, verse 2. Uh, and the prophet says, For all those things has my, my hand made, the Lord is saying about all creation. And all of those things have been, says the Lord, by me. But to this man, or this woman, I will look. Even to him who is poor and contrite in spirit, and I love this phrase, and to the one who trembles at my word. Amen. And uh, Jack and I were talking earlier today in, in the lane of the Catholic. Paul, Paul says to the Corinthians, I didn't come among you with persuasive words or the wisdom of men. But he said, I came among you trembling. And he goes on to say, I don't want your faith to be built upon persuasive words of men, but what? On the power of God. And so we, we were talking about, gee, I, I guess... Paul was kind of a, a timid fellow, and, and uh, he got in with that Corinthian church, that big cosmopolitan commercial city, and boy, he's up here just shaking like a leaf, presenting, no. No, Paul was never afraid of the people. He had the healthy, God-given fear of Jehovah. Mm -hmm. And his trembling was at the word of the Lord that it would, in fact, be delivered not in his persuasive words, he surely could be persuasive, but that the word of God that the people's faith was to be built upon, mm -hmm. therefore the church was to be built upon, yeah. would be built upon the power of the Spirit of God in their midst. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and so, so I, I look at this, and I, we recently had an opportunity to speak at a, a church that was a very unusual opportunity for us. And we went, and Elaine would tell you, by the time I got ready to stand, the pastor had invited me to come and present a message. It was my, it was my older brother's church. And, and by the time I was about to get up and stand, I am shaking like a leaf. I am, I am vibrating. I am trembling so badly. And I, I offered Elaine my, my trembling hand. I said, look at this. I, I am trembling. And, and Elaine has come to know this about me. I was not trembling because of the people I was going to speak to. I was trembling because of the God I was about to represent Amen. to those people. Well said. And, and in my heart of hearts, as I stood before those folks, this is to me, after all these years, this is the privilege that we have is to be drawn into life circumstances, whether it's to present a 25 minute message or to move among our peers and our family, whatever the opportunity is, God wants to secure a healthy fear in us. Not of the people, but of the privilege of carrying the message of the gospel to those that, whose lives we're coming in contact with. And so we look at the story of Aaron's sons. We look at the, the, the man to put his hand in the cart to make sure the ark doesn't fall over yeah. and it costs him his life. Mm -hmm. We look at Ananias and Sapphira and say, sweetheart, let, we, we made good money on this deal. Uh, we'll tell them we're going to do this, but let's, let's go buy us a new cart or a new car or, or some food for the pantry, whatever. And it costs them dearly. And all along the way, 
the Lord says to us, and these things have happened as examples for you so that you might move in the healthy, God-given fear of the Lord. This is our opportunity to bring the message of life. And if that doesn't make me tremble, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Very good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question? Maybe. Um, it depends on what it is. But I think the end of that question was, um, do, the two, do the sons of Aaron, do they go to heaven when they're struck down? Mm -hmm. or struck down? Mm. Can I take a little stab at that? I mean, please. <laughs> you know, there's uh, <coughs> Jesus talks about the unforgivable sin. People think that that's, especially in my tradition, kind of, it's kind of nebulous. We're, we're always afraid we're going to commit the unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. um, I think in some of these cases, these people may have, and ultimately, ultimately, I don't think I could, I don't, and they, maybe they could, but I don't know if anybody can definitively <laughs> say what happened to them except for God himself, and where we know that he'll make the, the righteous decision. But with that said, um, it, it seems to me that, that all of these people that suffered, uh, in, especially in Old, like Aaron's sons, they were, they were trying to, they, they knew better, but they were leading the people to sin. Uh, Eli's sons, yeah. okay, they were the priests there, and, they, and yet they were they were leading. Uh, they were, I mean, they were doing horrible things, committing incredible sins. They were leading Israel to sin. In fact, in Eli's sons' case, God says, "I will not blot out their sins. They're, they will not be Amen. forgiven." Right, right. That is the unforgivable sin. Balaam, uh, the, the sin about Balaam, you know, it was that he taught my people to sin. Um, those are unforgivable sins. Um, so it looks to me like when you are in a situation where you know God, uh, even Balaam, who never, apparently never converted, uh, knew God. I mean, at one point he said, I, I can't curse whom God's blessed. And yet, he figured out a way to do it. He goes, well, you know what, I can't do that, but if I get them to sin, then God himself will judge them, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So he went out of his way to teach Israel, to, to, to seduce them and to take them in. Uh, I think it's a little bit even like the Pharisees who knew that Jesus rose from the dead and said, hey, listen, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. We know he's alive, but we're going to cover that. I, you know what, these are leaders that have a clear view of God and are are leading people, God's people. God, I think God takes that seriously, that they're leading them. I think that God, rather than being an unloving God, <coughs> God's being a loving people to the nine, 99 that are going to be saved because there's a there's a potential that they're all going to be led by these leaders, supposedly the, the, the ones who know. And, um, it, and it, so I, I think that God said, I think that God said, if I'm not mistaken, that Eli's sons would never be forgiven. And I think that there's another spot in Scripture with about the same thing where it says, I will not forgive them. I will not blot their sins out. And so um, so I don't know if I look at something that got, when, when these people are doing it, the strange fire and getting people to commit idolatry and go back, the golden calf, oh, I, I know they're just going to, but you know, all that stuff, that is serious stuff that has that has generational influences. And we talked about to a thousand generations earlier. What would have happened then if all those people would have went astray? I mean, generations would have been affected. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of my take on it. All right, pop, pop question. Jesus Christ's blood <laughs> can cleanse any sin. True or false? True. True. Well, maybe false. So I'd like you to think about the book of Hebrews where it speaks of those who know the truth, deliberately turn their back on the truth. Yeah. It says there's no possibility or no possibility of getting your sin forgiven. There remains no sacrifice for sin. For those who knew the truth, embrace the truth, and intentionally turn their back on the truth, there is no sacrifice for sin. For sin. That's very clear. Yes. If God's all powerful, why would he not forgive every sin? What's that? If God's all powerful, why would he not then forgive every sin? Why would there be some sin that's too big? I think and that's a good, very good question. And we're that, we're talking about a limited number of cases now, by the way. We're not talking about somebody like Peter who denied the Lord under pressure. We're talking about somebody that embraces the truth and intentionally turns their back on God or leads people away from God. I think the reason for that is because God is very interested in covenant fidelity and because God takes sin very seriously. Mm -hmm. 
Now we take forgiveness seriously, and that's good. Isn't forgiveness great? But God also takes sin very seriously. And we tend not to take sin. How much of this is we're, we're pitting God's love against His holiness? That's right. And we're forgetting that, as you pointed out, as all of you guys have pointed out, it, that and you, Jack used the, the example of Aslan. I, I think too often we, if, if anything, this example in Leviticus 10, and we, we wrestle with it, I think if anything, it demonstrates our callousness and our casualness mm -hmm. towards sinfulness Amen, than it does anything else. Yeah. We become so enculturated mm -hmm. and we think, well, what's what's wrong with what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And I think that's 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 kind of key. Yeah. Can I just, you said if God is all-powerful. Well, He is. Yes. There, there's no if there. Yeah. God is omnipotent. That's all power. There is no power outside of Him. The power and authority. And they go together. Power, the, the, actually the words are close. Eurecia, that is power and authority. He is that. He also has created men in his image and likeness and they have will. He also has made provision in his son for all men to be saved. God so loved the yes, world that yes. he gave his only begotten son that how many? Whoever. Whosoever. Absolutely. Whosoever. And again, again, that word is used. Whosoever. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Old Testament has God speaking to Ezekiel. I do not have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their way and live. So it has nothing to do with God's power. Could God have made a world and robots where there would never be a possibility of sin? He could have, but he did not. So we deal with that which God did. So he made us with remarkable responsibility and remarkable possibilities. We can turn away from God, and in fact, men do. So, two things, or many things. God, the, will the God of the world do, do things right? That's Abraham's question. You know, you know the story. He's over at Sovereign Gomorrah. He's bargaining with he he's praying to God. He's saying, Lord, you said you're gonna destroy, well will you destroy? And then he you maybe goes down from fifty down to ten or whatever. And then he and this is how he reasons with it God. Will not the God of all the world do right? What's the answer to that? Yes. Yes, he will do right. And so I rest in that. God's judgment and God's love and God's wrath and God's love are all right. They are correct. So it's never, if, if, if I may say so, it's a false pre presupposition to say that the almightiness of God somehow cannot encompass also the will of men who would mm -hmm. oppose Is that helpful? I, I, I hope it is. Uh, it's it's, it's 8.30, and we're, you guys have been great. We, we've been at it for about an hour and 15. I'm going to ask each of you one more question that I want your answer from. There are four different questions, okay? And, and this will kind of wrap up everything that we did. So, <laughs> so here you go. So, so Donald, we'll start with you. And these are questions that the students did. Do animals go to heaven? Do animals go to heaven? Don hopes so. I tell you that. He loves <laughs> animals like me. I do. For those of you who may be on the same age that I have lived on all my life, I have an extreme uh, pet lover, especially dogs. Um, <laughs> um, my last, our last dog was a uh, cross between a uh, miniature dachshund and a beagle. Mm. And we had Penny for 15 and a half years. And halfway through her life, one of my grandsons, not maliciously, while we were away on vacation, jumped on Penny's back and broke her back. And we got a call about midnight from my son John and said, Penny's had a terrible accident. When we got home, I should say, when I hung up the phone, my making sure as I can to answer your question, when we hung up the phone, I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me from Deuteronomy 28.6, and I remembered what that said. Part of it says, and blessed shall your herds be. And we drove from Nova Scotia back to our home in, uh, in, in central New Hampshire. 
And as we drove in to pick up our dog, I felt the Holy Spirit spoke to me a second time and said, don't look at your puppy. Um. I knew what he was saying to me. I've said something to you from the Word of God. And I want that to govern what you're going to do next. But we picked up the dog that night, and Penny, I'm not exaggerating, exaggerating was broken in two. We, we wrapped her as best we could in the blanket and took her home, and the next morning, I picked her up, and I had a little little area out my back, and I set her down in the, in, in the grass, and, and she crawled as best she could to relieve herself, and if you touched her, she would cry out. Now, I mentioned earlier, I have been Jack's protege for almost 50 years now. And uh, one of the things I've loved about my mentor is he's a man of compassion. And I'm not sure I got all of that from him, but I got a portion of it somewhere along the way. And my heart broke for my dog. Mm. And I had heard the Lord in my heart in Nova Scotia say, Deuteronomy 8 6. And so I took the land was, this was a difficult time for us because I didn't share with the land what was in my heart. I took my Bible and I took a small bottle of olive oil and I took it out of the backyard. And I read Deuteronomy 26 to my dog. Mm -hmm. and, and then I took the, the, the container of oil and I poured it right down her, her distended broken back. Three veterinarians that we checked with in the next couple of days said, put the dog down. It's the merciful thing to do. Mm. I began, in the next three days, I began to weep over, I'm sorry, but this is what happened. I began to weep over, and I began to pray and pour my heart out over this dog. I would put my hands on this dog many times a day for the next three days. Mm. And I would weep over her because I, I am an extreme, I admit it, I'm an extreme dog lover. And I loved this dog. And, and she would look up and I couldn't move her to a different place in the cage without her just crying out. And for three days and into the evenings, I would go out several times a day and I'd put my hands on this dog and I would pray for her. I'm, I have to say, insert this truth that God has made so real to me. God is not diminished when he helps people. Amen. Did you hear what I said? God is not diminished when you pray for someone and God meets that need. If he is, trust me, I have no business praying for a dumb dog in central New Hampshire. Not if there are those that need the Lord more and God's ability to meet their need will be lessened by me praying for a dog. Okay. The fourth morning, we got up and I went out and Here's Penny with a blanket over her, and her back is straight, and she is walking around. In this <laughs> and with no exaggeration, within two weeks, this dog was chasing squirrels all over her. And believe me, she's chased squirrels. Yes, she has. We'd go and walking with her, and she would run off and run back and up. <laughs> and, and I've almost gotten to the answer, I'm sorry. But the, that dog became a testimony for the mercy of God in our neighborhood. And we would have our neighbors, our, one neighbor would call and say, uh, Don, would you pray for such and such? And this, <laughs> and, this is, and this is what she would say to me. She'd say, I know God hears your prayers because of Penny. Amen. Wow. Amen. Now, this is, no this is no exaggeration. This is no exaggeration. This is no exaggeration. Three days before we came down to be with Jack and Kathy for these three weeks, the phone rang, the gentleman's name, an old friend from our former church, Joe Pasquetto, called me and he said, Kathy has asked if you would let me bring our dachshund over to pray for her. We know God hears your prayer. That's awesome. That is so now, great. I hasten to say, in 49 years, we've seen a lot of people helped with prayer. Now, answering the question, do I believe that our animals are in heaven? My honest, considered opinion is, I don't know. <laughs> but I will say this. I, I do believe that 
in the, in the creation in this age and in the age to come. Yeah, there you go. He lives in the earth. If, if there is a measure of, I love the Greek word, I mispronounce it badly among my studious brothers, and I say that in all respect. The, the Greek word for the word compassion, it's a great word. The word mispronounced is splenchnizome. That's mispronounced, I admit it. It literally means the stirring within me mm -hmm. of the God-given care and love and heart and desire to touch the needs of those in my life. Mm -hmm. I believe that the compassion that God gives us, some of us have more of it for animals than others. I admit to that. Mm -hmm. But what God has deposited in you and me when there is a stirring in my life over a given situation, as there was with the Lord Jesus, you read this, this is my assignment to you for some time when you have a chance. Go over to Matthew's Gospel. There are several accounts where Jesus of Nazareth was gripped with compassion of the Lord. I can't find one instance where that happened where there was not something supernatural that occurred as a result of it. You can read that for yourself. In the meantime, I'm going to trust the Lord for the love he has given me for my dogs and cats and parakeets and canary. And when we get to heaven, somehow I believe there will be a full representation of that caring heart mm -hmm. for us when we go on with it. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. That's it. That's Great. We have humans, we have angels. Has God created any other sentient beings outside of our creators? <laughs> well, uh, he's a creative God. I don't know if he necessarily stopped with uh, the creation of Earth, and and uh, you know, I I don't really know. There's I don't I don't know if the Bible tells us, but I would I would think that God is a God of continual creativity and, and power, and and he fills all the I. I uh, uh, probably not that that uh, that that are involved in our in our area. I'm just I'm just thinking. I've not thought about that in a long time. Uh, but uh, I think that um, I think that probably uh, those two would be enough for me to handle yeah. here on Earth. But I but but <coughs> with all that said, I, I don't think that there's any anything that would uh, that would keep us from thinking or that God isn't continually creating. It, it, probably not man. I think man was made in God's image. And I think you talk about C.S. Lewis. I mean, C.S. Lewis in the space trilogy kind of right. deals with a little bit about that. That anything that was actually created, uh, you know, had to be was was like man, um, because man is created in the image of God, and that is a powerful thing that I don't think we think about uh, as much and as highly as as we ought to. Uh, but. Um, I, I, um, I, I know that uh, there's no end to the planets. Uh, the bigger the telescopes, uh, the, the more you or the more uh, stars and planets and everything else we see, and it's spectacular. It's amazing. I mean, I, uh, you know, the, I was I was stunned when this that satellite went by Pluto, and it keeps on going and sending back even more information now. I, uh, and, and it just boggles our mind just within that. And yet we know that way out there, there's so much more. And um, probably God has <coughs> angels watching over the uh, all those other areas, yeah. but I I don't I don't know that. Okay. <laughs> Andrew, um, does Scripture speak to who we can or should vote for? Is it sin to vote for someone who uh, supports issues that are contrary to Scripture? In short, is God a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> Not a Republican or a Democrat. That's for sure. But um, I think that inferentially uh, it's true from Scripture that to support someone um, who would enact something clearly sinful, uh, that is to support someone <clears throat> who would vote for uh, abortion, same-sex marriage, and so on, and establish policies that would preserve them, uh, yeah, I think that's clearly sinful. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.11, don't have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, mm -hmm. but rather expose them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the notion that um, you could in good conscience... Now, I, I want to qualify this by saying sometimes there might be a, 
uh, only we have a two-party system. There might be two candidates, and one candidate is just egregiously bad, and the other one is just comparatively bad. <laughs> it might be necessary to vote for one that's comparatively bad. But I must say that uh, if you have candidates that uh, support uh, or tolerant infanticide, murdering little babies, uh, those in the womb, what's called abortion, we need to call it really what a better word is aborticide. People don't like, that's a good word, people don't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. and actually, a miscarriage is technically speaking an abortion, the loss of life mm -hmm. or a preborn child. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we mean abortion mm -hmm. on demand. But actually, the word for that is called aborticide, which mm -hmm. people don't like because it sounds like homicide, yes. mm -hmm. suicide, genocide, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, or those that in, would intentionally support um, contra biblical sexual notions and try to codify them into law, yeah, you're, you're violating uh, you're violating the moral law of God. Moral law. Now, the problem people have with that day is say, well, I just want to be very careful to keep the church out of politics. Well, yes and no. The church isn't a political precinct. The church isn't to be a republic. There's no republican churches or democratic churches. But there should be biblical churches. Mm -hmm. And where these issues um, address what the word of God quite plainly addresses, they have to be addressed biblically and you have to take a stand on them. So that's necessary. Now here's what happens. I'll be done with this in just a second. Day. A church that says and ministers that say, I'm not going to take a stand on any political issues. I'm not political. Here's what eventually happens. What happens is because they don't address these issues, then it does not, it's not the case the church is not political. The church members develop non-biblical political views. And those come into the church all the while the pastor is saying, I'm not going to be political. And here's what sadly happens. Because in our culture, almost everything is becoming politicized. Mm -hmm. To somebody, to a pastor who says, I'm never going to deal with a political issue, eventually that will mean I will never preach anything. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? The, the, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ will one day become, as it was historically sometimes, mm -hmm. a political issue. To stand up and say Jesus is the only way of salvation mm -hmm. could land, who knows, could land. Today, in some cultures, it does land Jesus. So to say, well, if that's a political issue, so I'm not going to really preach that Jesus is the only way of salvation would be to compromise the faith. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it is a sin to, to actively seek to elect people who are actively opposed, actively opposed to the moral law of God. Nice. And then, Jack, I'm going to give you the last word here. Uh, is, uh, is it okay just to be a part of the Bible study? Can that serve as a substitute for the church? And I guess the bigger part would be how important is the local church in the life of the believer? You have an hour? <laughs> uh, yes. Desperately important. You, 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 I, I want to be as radical as I possibly can be. Radical means to the root. That's what it means. Raiders root. Go to the root. The root is you cannot be a Christian by yourself or just in some little small group where you sit around and share your ignorance. That's right. You, if you are a Christian, you are really a part of the body of Christ. And the thing on earth that, rep that is the body of Christ are churches and individual churches there. Today, uh, Andrew touched on this, and, and you all did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think somebody said, and, and it, it's a good question. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in your midst. Yes, <coughs> that's very true. Uh, two or three Christians that are gathered together, of course Christ there. I, I can say, uh, if I'm sitting alone by myself, is Christ in me? Yes. Well, He is. God the Holy Spirit lives in me, and therefore Christ lives in me. And so therefore, if I'm by myself, I'm, I'm a Christian by myself. But never, ever are Christians to remain alone. Now, marks of the church are more than the presence of Christ. That's the essential mark of the church. But it's not the only mark of the church. Read the rest of the New Testament. Read what Paul, Paul said, Tim, uh, said to Titus to Crete. And what he said, he says, go set in order. And what do you go do? Appointed elders. Appointed leaders. Appoint, and, and, and the word is to rule, to rule over, to, and so on. So churches have marks. One is a, a godly leadership ordered by God. Number two, discipline. You can't just, uh, churches have to have discipline. The doing of the, of the elements, the two main ones, baptism and the Lord's table. Now, 
You say, well, what if we don't have well? Yeah, there are exceptions to the rule, but the rules are this is what constitutes a church. It doesn't have to be big. Matter of fact, most churches in the world are not big. In, in the United States, they're not big. Our church in uh, city church is not big. We have several hundred members, you know. But we have order and we have all the elements and the marks of a church. And of course, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So you can't do those things ultimately just by yourself. And you can't do them in a just simply a Bible study. You you you, you cannot do it. Usually in Bible studies, you don't have submission to the ones that God has put in rule over you. You just sort of, you know, you are all there together. That's not a church. You can be a part of a church. And I like Bible studies. Good grief. I've been in them all my life. I think all those things are good. Anyway, you can grow in grace. But that's not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It just simply isn't. It doesn't have to be big. It can be very small. But it needs to have all the marks in order to be... I was down in California many, many years ago, and, and uh, there was some brothers meeting in a wonderful home church, and you know the story. And, and they, were, they were functioning, and they were asking, and I'm sitting there, and I said, guys, you are a church. You just, I want you to recognize that you are a church. You have leadership, you're taking the table of the Lord, you're practicing uh, the Lord's table and baptism, you have an order that... I said, you are, so let's say... Who, we, we are a church, and they began, you know. Okay, so, no, you, you, you the, the church is exceeded. Matter of fact, the most important thing, the most important institution, mm -hmm. great Asia, family is important, extremely, is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. What we do, gather together, on the Lord's Day particularly, because he said, don't forsake the assemblies of yourselves together, as a matter of some is already, that right of Hebrew, what we do in worship to God is the most important political act in all the world. Amen. Amen. We are declaring that Jesus is Lord. Amen. We, are, we are calling upon Him. We are praying. We are priests. We are intercessors. We stand uh, between many, sometimes heaven and hell for people. We intercede. All those things. And that will not happen by ourselves. Not ultimately. Not ultimately. So, to, to be a member of the body of Christ really technically is to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But remember there are, there has to be, what, oh boy, I just want, the church, people say, well, the, the church is just an idea, kind of a, almost everywhere in scripture, when the word ecclesia is used for church, it is talking about a local body of assembled believers. That's right. what it is. That's right. Uh, Occasionally, you'll have the, the, the big picture. You know, well, we are the church of the universe, but almost everywhere, it's a local body of assembled believers. That's how important I think it is. Nice. All right. We say thank you for our speakers.